As y'all have heard me say before, the most important part of planning any adventure are the snacks. And if you're looking for a delicious and nutritious snack that packs a real protein punch, crack into a good source of protein with tasty, healthy, wonderful pistachios. Each one ounce serving of wonderful pistachios contains six grams of protein giving you over 10% of your daily value in that one serving. It's one of the highest protein nuts out there. And that's not all. Pistachios are also known for the fiber and better for you unsaturated fats, which may help keep you feeling fuller longer. Best part, wonderful pistachios come in a variety of flavors and sizes. Perfect for enjoying with your family and friends or taking them with you on your summer adventures for those snacks we're talking about. So whether you're dropping off the kiddos or running between meetings or about to climb a mountain, fuel up with a healthy and tasty snack. Wonderful Pistachios will be your new go-to. You can check them out at wonderfulpistachios.com and learn more about how these little green wonders can power up your day. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason, and today's episode is a Throwback Thursday episode to a few years ago uh, when we talked to Andy McGee. This is one of my favorite episodes, I'll have to say. I, I, I think the idea of visiting every national park in a year is just crazy. And by the way, this isn't just like national parks like you're thinking of, Grand Canyon, uh, Yellowstone, all that. It's every national park site, which there are about 420 of those now. Um, Everything from the Smithsonian Museums, every little battlefield, uh, historical places, national seashores, national monuments like Mount Rushmore, and then every national park is, and the stats and the vastness of these places are crazy. And Andy's going to reflect on the experience. And I know a lot of you are probably thinking that's way too fast to do something like this. That's like a lifetime to experience it. Why would you do it so quickly? And he had been to a lot of these places. And so he just wanted to set this goal. And you know what? What it made me think, and something we talk about on the show sometimes is, you know, f- for adventure, you need framework. Wh- whether that framework's an event or a challenge or, you know, th- through hiking a trail. You need some sort of framework, and that framework's different for everybody. I've got a lot of friends that are fastest known time enthusiasts. They try to, you know, be the fastest to climb something. I I have other friends that are, you know, they they it's photography focus or it's uh, an event focus. So find out what format really gets you going. Whether it's doing something new that no one's ever done before, um, or finding something, you know, geotagging or fossil hunting or finding an animal that you want to see out in the wild, like whatever that framework is, uh, can be different. And it doesn't have to follow, you know, the norm. What Andy did was pretty unique and hard to do. And we're going to listen to just how impactful and beautiful of a story this is. And I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. I'm really going to enjoy re-listening to it. Let's go ahead and dive in. Andy, welcome. Thank you, Mason. Very nice to be here. Yeah. So I always ask this first, where are you coming from today and, and where is home? Uh, I'm sitting in my home in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, very cool. I didn't realize you were from St. Louis. That's right. I'm in the Midwest. What an adventure you had. <laughs> yes, that's true. I did have an adventure. So, all right. So, you know, folks heard a little bit about it in the intro that I, you know, I record them before I release the show, just make sure I get all my facts right. But what what gave you the idea to go to all the national park sites in one year? In one year, I mean that's that average is more than one one a day. So that's that's just a crazy pace. What made you want to do that? It is it it is a crazy pace, and it's it's not necessarily you know a, a great way to visit the parks. But I I wanted to um, uh, I wanted to do something a little challenging and a little different, personally challenging, and and. Um, I'd had a uh, I'd had a difficult uh, 2018, a lot of personal uh, 
upheaval in my life. I got divorced and some other things. And um, I was just at a point in um, late 2018 where I, I just needed a change of pace for my own sanity. And so I decided to um, uh, do this crazy idea. I had no idea if it could be done. I had no idea if if I could do it, uh, if it was possible. Um, but I just decided that, um, I needed some time away and I needed to focus on something that I really enjoyed. And one of those things, one of my lifelong passions has always been the national parks and our public lands here in the United States. And so, um, I know I knew that I had visited, I don't know, somewhere around 100 and 120, maybe a little bit more <clears throat> of the park units before in my lifetime, some of them many, many times. And um, I just got to thinking, you know, what if I just tried to see them all? I didn't even know how many there were uh, at the time, but um, I thought it would be a, an interesting challenge and uh, a real good excuse to just sort of get away and uh, have some time alone for a while. Jeez, man. That, I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's, it's probably one of my biggest passions, too, is the national park system. Obviously, you know, it's all tiered, uh, you know, with the national parks and you've got all sorts of other national sites. And I'm sure when you saw the whole list, you were like, holy cow, that's that's a lot of them because when you did it, it was 419. I think it's up to 422 now. Yeah, I think we're at 423 today. We just added a new one uh, this week as, or last week, as a matter of fact, the uh, Merle and Medgar Evers house. But yeah, I uh, once I looked at the list, I, I was just kind of floored. I, I didn't realize, I don't think, even ha spending decades in, you know, uh, exploring the park system, I, I I didn't realize how diverse it was, how broad it was. Uh, I didn't realize there were so many sites that I had already like driven past, you know, half a dozen times and never stopped at. Um, and the other thing I didn't realize was that there are national park unit sites in all 50 states the District of Columbia, obviously, and four United States territories. And so that really got me excited because at that point before the trip, um, I still had maybe 10 states uh, that I had never visited before. And so the idea of, you know, actually seeing the entirety of the United States plus four of our five territories uh, just that excited me tremendously. So once I started looking into it really quickly, I, I, I got super enthused and I just thought this is going to be the greatest, you know, adventure of a lifetime, a great challenge lo logistically and personally. And um, uh, but just I, I started to get really excited about all the possibilities and all the incredible things I could see along the way. Wow. I mean, you're, you're, it's such a vast array of things. You know, it, obviously the national parks that people are familiar with, it's the vast beauty, and those are diverse as can be. But then you start throwing in the historical aspect, the, you know, the battlefields, the seashores, the recreation areas. I mean, it was essentially an amazing cross-section of everything American, everything for world history even, just, just so many iconic things you were going to experience in that year at such a crazy pace that was uh how did you even begin planning a route like what did that look like obviously you started to fit it all in a calendar year you started january 1st um wh what did planning look like and how many iterations of maybe the route did you did you go through till you landed on one you know i um i once i decided to do the trip i i bought a nice um map that had all of the park units on it. And um, I framed it up and I put it, I hung it on the wall right above my computer at my desk. And so I could sit and stare at the map and uh, do the research on the computer all at the same time. And I spent a lot of time just looking up at that map and, and imagining different routes, um, things like that. What, what happened though, is that Pretty quickly on, I realized that in, in order to do what is basically just a gigantic road trip of the United States, you needed to have a lot of flexibility. And 
uh, if you tried to plot it out, you know, day by day, or even, you know, this park and then that park and then that park, you're bound to screw it up because there are so many unforeseen events that could happen, bad weather, um, you know, a vehicle problems, illness, emergency shutdown, a government shutdown. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I recognized really quickly that I had to be flexible. Plus, I wanted to have the 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 option to spend longer or shorter amounts of times at different places depending on circumstances. And um, but but within that, there are a few things that I I knew for sure. So I knew that. I was starting on January 1st. Well, I live in the Midwest and it's cold here. So I didn't want to be doing a lot of traveling and outdoors stuff uh, in the Midwest where it was cold. So I decided to start the trip in um, Southern Florida and I began at Dry Tortugas National Park, which is um, uh, on an island way out in the, in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. It's one of the last of the chain of keys Florida Keys. And it's one of it's it's one park that I had never been to before and had been wanting to go for a long time. And the other reason is because it's not on the way to anywhere else. It's like way out there by itself. And there's one way in and there's one way out. And so I thought this would be a good place to start. So uh, I knew that I would be doing, you know, Florida and the southern states in the winter time. And then as the weather started to get warmer throughout the year, I would sort of be switchbacking uh, up the, the continental U.S. in latitudes back and forth across the country, more or less. Um, I also realized that there were going to be a couple of chunks of the trip that were uh, logistically much more complicated. And I started to call those the Caribbean leg the Alaskan leg and the Pacific leg. And I, um, I decided to, one of the smartest decisions I made in the planning stages was to uh, hire a travel agent to help me plot out those three sections in particular. Uh, because there's a lot of air travel and boats and lodging and this and that. And I just didn't want to be personally responsible for getting all of that right because I probably wouldn't have. Um, so uh, that helped a lot. And I, ha I sort of had, you know, I had the Caribbean leg uh, was came in January. Uh, the Alaskan leg came in the middle of the summer and the Pacific leg came at the end of the year in December. And so those those three chunks really kind of helped to bookend large parts of the trip. And the rest of it was just me driving around the continental U.S. You know, that that I was going to ask you how you made those more challenging national parks uh, fit within that frame? Because th those exponentially more difficult to visit, you know, the Virgin Islands or um, Dry right. Tortugas, uh, Samoa, Hawaii and Alaska. Those, I mean, there's just so much space and obviously air travel and um, some island, a lot of island national parks and just way yes. out there locations. Yes. And, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> I just, I mean, it must have been crazy trying to fit it all, trying to stay organized with it all, honestly. It was, um, you know, part of it was very logistically challenging. Uh, and there were definitely times of the trip where I was, you know, sort of glued to a very precise itinerary trying to hit flights and things like that. But the vast majority of it was much more relaxed and much more loose. I mean, there were so many mornings, I can't even tell you where I would wake up and uh, get around and, and, and literally just look at the atlas and figure out where the next nearest park was. And that's where I would drive to. And I'd stay as long as I wanted. And then, you know, so there were a lot of days like that because the whole thing is stretched out over a whole entire year it never really felt super stressed or or um uh, intense at any given moment that's good because 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 to me it, it did seem it, it seemed like a breakneck pace i was obviously following your instagram beautiful pictures you know so i mean it, it was just so cool to see your stamps every day i saw the first stamp you missed was actually a desoto memorial yeah Street. that's right and that's right. I, I live right next to it, 
right there. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, okay. I, I was like, I scrolled all the way back today, got, kind of getting ready for the interview. And I was like, let me see him. Cause he obviously hit that one. And it's a really small one. I actually just visited We just moved here. And, uh, and I was like, wow, this is a really small park, but Andy went to this. He drove through here just to see this. And sure enough, you you said something about missing or it was closed, government shut down and all that. But uh, yeah, man, you, you went out, way out of the way for some really small little locations. H- how did it feel? You said the pace wasn't too bad throughout the whole year. Was was that true really most of the time? Was there ever, ever times of, of, of intensity with, with trying to keep up? Um, you know, the, the beginning of the trip was hectic because, uh, of course I had done all this plant planning, um, for a few months anyway. And, um, and then right before I was about to set out for the trip, uh, we had that government shutdown in late December, 2018. And I, you know, I didn't panic, but I, I, I got really worried because, um, uh, uh, I, I was afraid that it was going to stretch into my trip and that was going to screw things up. Um, what I didn't realize was that it was going to stretch into the trip and take up most of the month of January. And um, so once I got into it, it was really frustrating. I, I had a, a, the first week or so was really very good. When I got down to Southern Florida, the um, the parks were um, technically open because they were being staffed by a nonprofit agency that was filling in the gaps where the rangers would have been. So the visitor centers were open, uh, some of the facilities were open, uh, and you could access the parks. After a few of those, I started to run into parks that were closed. And you're and you're right, the Soto National Memorial was the first one that I visited that was just closed. And then after that, it was. <clears throat> Th- about about three weeks of closed parks, just one after another. Uh, I think there were about 30 of them that I hit all together that were just closed, inaccessible. And, um, uh, and then the government reopened and I sort of got back on track, but it was late January when that happened. And I didn't know, I mean, I'm a pretty tenacious person and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a completionist. And so I knew I had it in me to try to go back to all those places. Um, and I didn't know if I would screw up my larger schedule on the trip if I did, but I did it anyway. And so I spent a lot of February driving back through the Southern States and hitting a lot of those parks that were closed when, um, when I was there the first time. And in short, short, I, I ended up pulling it off, but, um, uh, that that time of the year, that part of the trip, the beginning uh, first couple of months, they did seem a little hectic. And the other the other sort of thing is that uh, I was just starting out on this, and I really didn't have a very good sense of what kind of pace I should be keeping. And so I think I was probably moving along a little quicker than I that I needed to be anyway. Um, but it all worked out. Yeah, talk about flexibility. You know, being able to. I mean, that it just seems like you'd have to have it so dialed in, but to be able to just double back and hit a bunch of places that were closed because of an unforeseen shutdown, that's a, uh, yeah, kudos to you for with the plan. And that's incredible. So let me, let me ask you this, you know, before we get into, you know, some of your favorite parks and some, some experiences out there, what what did you do with all that time in your truck? Did you listen to <laughs> stuff? Did you just sit in silence? That's a lot of time driving. Uh, You know, I, I normally wouldn't have done this, but I ended up listening to the news a lot in the truck, uh, especially that first couple of months, because the the shutdown was was so uh, was was like it was consuming all of my time and energy, and I was every day I was sort of constantly rejuggling the trip to try to uh, uh, work around the shutdown as best as I could. So I was I was really glued to the news, just looking for any glimmer of hope that um, it would end. Um, so I did that a lot. But uh, after that, um, you know, I listened to a lot of music and, and things like that. I, I I'm quite comfortable to sit in the truck and drive by myself for long periods of time. And I can do it all day long. Well, apparently I can do it all year long. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. So, so what was your sleeping arrangement? Were you camping in the truck? Were you getting hotels? What, what did that look like for for most of the year? As, 
A little bit of everything. I, I didn't intend uh, to sleep in the truck. I actually, I'm a big fan of car camping. And um, uh, so uh, I had lots of camping gear in the truck and um, uh, I camped at a lot of campgrounds, both within the parks, mostly within the parks. Um, ended up doing a lot of hotels, more than I anticipated, but it was fine. Got lucky with a few uh, cool lodges in some of the uh, bigger parks here and there. And uh, actually only ended up having to sleep in the truck uh, three nights out of the out of the whole trip. Um, one of them was on the way up to Alaska. One of them was in the parking lot of the Anchorage airport. And one was on the way back from Alaska. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that helped make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. All, all in all in Alaska or near Alaska. Yeah, all in Alaska, Jeez. that's right. Tell us about, you know, kind of what was what were some of the earliest best experiences of the trip? I'm I'm sure, you know, it's hard to rank the experience based on which park you went to, but there has to be like an upper tier of of things that happen that you just really hold on to as great takeaways from the experience there there are a lot of moments like that um you know i remember earlier on in the year um my visit to death valley which was actually the first time i'd ever been there it's one of the few big parks out west that i had never visited before but i had three nights camping in death valley and um and this was relatively this was in the a, a few weeks after the government was reopened and so uh, it, it it was one of the first big park experiences that i had that really felt like a normal park experience things were back to normal and, and i just remember I, I still remember that very very vividly it was really beautiful really extraordinary and i was really blown away by the um the magnitude and the 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 sheer beauty of Death Valley National Park. It's um for I, I, any of your listeners who've been there would know, but it, it's you know it's a very desolate place, but there is an incredible beauty in that desolation that really attracted me, and I I I love that place a lot, and I, I think a lot about it. It's one of the one of the parks that I'm itching to get back to as soon as possible. Mm. I, I'm I'm sure at that uh, pace, there's a lot of places you feel that way about where it's you could have just stayed longer, but you you know you just had hundreds more to see. There are there are a lot of places like that, and of course, you know, for most of the park units, you can you can always spend more time, and uh, and I knew that very well. Um, but that's not what this trip was about. This trip was something a little different, and. Um, uh, and so I knew that I would have shorter visits at a lot of places that where you could easily spend more time. Um, another, I had another experience. Um, this was in this was during the government shutdown, so this would have been January. I stopped at Congaree uh, National Park. Uh, the park was accessible, but it was basically all closed down. Everything was closed. The visitor center was closed. The restrooms were closed. The campground was closed and all this kind of stuff. And I, I got there relatively late in the day and I was the only person in this entire national park. Uh, and that wow. is a really crazy thing because that never happens. And, um, and so I spent uh, you know, hour and a half or two hours hiking around in this uh, this incredible park with nobody, no rangers, no other visitors, nothing, nobody. And I just I remember that being so incredibly special uh, to to have this place all to myself. <clears throat> it was also very eerie and kind of creepy at the same time. Um, but that's one of the sort of positive things that came out of the government shutdown was uh, your uh, uh, opportunity to experience some of these places in a way that you will never, ever get again. And, and I, I remember that very vividly as well. 
Wow. I, I, I can't even imagine. I, I can't imagine a little bit. I was able to visit some parks during uh, the pandemic uh, just nearby and very few people, almost yeah. no one. And that was a sensation I've never experienced in some of those same spots that would be usually filled with people. So I can't imagine all the things you got to see. Golly. So, so I mean, I don't even know how to capture all this in one conversation, but you know, y- you just saw the most incredibly epic places in one single year. How did you process it? What were you doing to kind of make sure that you like remembered this and shared it and, and you know, just, just captured it as best you can for, to, to think about for years to come? That's a good question. And, and, um, you know, just sort of on a personal internal level, <clears throat> the truth is here I am almost a full year out from the beginning of the trip and I am still processing the trip. I am mm-hmm. still um, remembering moments and and events and, and things that I did. Um, it, it's it was it's so much input um, in such a short amount of time. Uh, it it is very difficult to kind of process the whole thing. But while I was doing it, um, I, I took tons and tons of photographs. Uh, I'm sort of a amateur photographer and, um, it's one of my hobbies and, and I shot, uh, uh, somewhere around 250,000 photographs last year in the parks. And I also did a lot of audio recordings. I kept a daily journal and uh, I wrote a blog every 10 days uh, about the experience. And, you know, all of those kind of little elements that I employed to kind of record the moments of the trip, they added up to a lot. And so I I ended up generating four terabytes of data last year on the trip oh, i had to I had to buy two new hard drives along the way just to be able to store everything i've spent a good part of this year uh after the trip going back through and uh, sifting through all of that content that i created it's so much it's <laughs> so much stuff <laughs> four terabytes man i mean it's worth it you know these places are worth it to me i you know I, I, be trigger happy when you're in be such incredible places what were some of the reactions you got from people, either from family or uh, just from people you came across out on the trip? When I first floated the idea to my friends and family, um, everybody everybody who knows me um, said, oh, yeah, you should do that. Uh, nobody questioned it. Nobody second guessed it. Um, you know, the, the people close to me, they knew that I was in a a state of mind at the time where I needed to do, I needed a diversion. And so I think they were happy for me to, uh, to go away and take on something interesting. Once I start, once the news of it, the trip sort of got out onto social media and stuff, the, the reactions were more mixed. And I think that, uh, um, I think a lot of people, I got a lot of kind of negative comments from people thinking that I was an idiot or doing something foolish or, or, or people that were, took it really personal that I was trying to fit in all the parks in one year, as opposed to spending, you know, a, a week or two weeks at a time in any given place. But that's not what the trip was about again, like I said. So, but once I got rolling and once I started sharing the experience on social media, uh, I think it found its audience or an audience found it and, and it, it kind of took on a life of its own. And, and before too long, I really felt like the, um, I felt like the trip was bigger than me and was, uh, something that I was, uh, pr- not only proud and and responsible for sharing, but something that I was um, that it almost became my obligation to share it. If that makes any sense, that um, uh, that that I was doing something that a lot of people were interested in, and it was my responsibility to share that to the best of my ability. That, that that blows me away. The negative feedback, I I can get it because we get that too with this show with people doing um, challenges, trying to you know run across the Grand Canyon faster than anybody, fastest known times, and 
once you get it into your head that no amount of time in any national park will ever be enough, then <laughs> you can kind of just say, I mean, I, personally, I've driven hours just to see Yosemite Valley on a work trip, for instance, just to see the valley turn around. That's because that's yeah. all I had time for. It's worth it. It's worth an eight hour drive. It's worth whatever you can do to just see a scene in a national park to me. And to be able to fit them all in a year, of course you don't get to spend as much time as you should or you want to, but that, yeah, like you said, that's not what it's about. And the fact that you got to, to experience all this and cram it in a, in a, in a medium no one else can really relate to is just, I find it mind blowing, man. I just find it mind blowing. Was there a cluster of parks outside of death Valley or an area or a type of area that just, that, that, that just really captured you? Well, in, in general, uh, the, um, the Alaska parks almost taken as a whole, um, are, are just, they're so extraordinary and I'd never been to Alaska before. And so the whole experience was new for me. And I, I, uh, I drove up there, um, partly because I wanted that experience as well. I wanted to understand the distance and the time it took to get there. And, and I wanted to see, uh, you know, British Columbia and the Yukon territory. Um, yeah, not too shabby themselves. Not they? too shabby, <laughs> not at all. Um, but you know, when I think about those parks, I think about the word wilderness and, you know, we, we, we like to think that we have, unbridled wilderness areas here in the lower 48. And, and, and the truth is we do have some, you know, and a lot of those areas are within some of our larger national parks, but until you get up there and see some of these places that, um, you know, I I'm thinking like, um, uh, uh, you know, Gates of the Arctic National Park and Antioch Chak National Monument, which is our least visited park with an average of 100 visitors a year. These places that have, you know, zero infrastructure whatsoever. They, it, you know, I, I, I mean it, like no visitor centers, no roads. You can't drive there. You have to fly on a bush plane. No trails of any kind, no signage of any kind, no electricity, no cell phone signal, no camping areas. Uh, GPS probably won't work. You know, you uh, when you get to some of these places, <clears throat> it's it's you and the pilot and the plane and whatever you guys brought with you. And everything else is pure unadulterated wilderness it's it's these areas you know these are the most sort of rudimentary elemental uh places that i've ever been to and some of the you know most wonderfully preserved wilderness that we have left in this country you know it's it's air water earth ice and and, and bears that want to eat you i mean it's just like <laughs> it's so insane <clears throat> And when you when you experience that, um, it, at least for me, it really shifted my perspective and my understanding of what I what I thought wilderness was. Do, do you have a story that you could share with us of, of, of just a, an experience, either with a person or animal or just something humorous that happened out there that kind of uh, can encapsulate adventure? Oh, that's so many stories. I don't know. I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll talk about my um, my flight out to Antioch Jack National Monument. Um, it's um, it's a it's a six mile wide uh, volcanic crater, half a mile deep, and it's out on the Alaska Peninsula, uh, pretty far away from everything else. And it's our least visited park unit for two reasons. One is a because it's incredibly remote; you have to hire a pilot to take you out there. Um, and second, because the weather there is eternally crappy and the weather is so bad that the pilots won't fly out there most of the time. <clears throat> so if you want to go and visit this place, there's a really good chance that you have to sit at King Salmon, Air, uh, Alaska, for a few days waiting for the weather to be good enough for the mm -hmm. pilot to fly you out there. I got super, super lucky, as I did with a lot of things on this trip. And as soon as I arrived in King Salmon, uh, they picked me up and took me straight to the plane because the weather was perfect. And we flew right out there. 
But flying out into the middle of nowhere in a you know little Cessna plane, float plane, um, with a crazy pilot who, I mean, all the pilots up there are crazy and they're extremely skilled and it's a real joy to ride with them. But you fly out, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's insane to even think about it. You, you fly out into the middle of nowhere, um, you see the crater on the horizon ringed with clouds and it's basically just this giant stone bowl that just sort of sits in the clouds and you get closer and you get closer and then you fly over the rim of this crater down into it and the pilot circles the plane around the rim of the crater descending altitude the whole time and then he lands on this mint green lake in the middle of the of the, the volcanic crater and parks the plane on a beach and um and you know we stopped and and i said can i get out and hike and he said you can do whatever you want to just don't take too long and i said okay he, i'm gonna go hike and he said i'm gonna sit here and watch the weather and uh I got out and I hiked around, took some photographs and came back and we flew back out of the crater. I mean, it just, and, and we were probably the only two people in, in at, at least, at least a 50 mile radius, if not more, just insane. Imagine just the feeling uh, to, to, you know, if you were playing this for him to fly off and just leave you there, the, I mean, <laughs> you, the way you describe it, I actually don't know about this park. I have to look it up. Sounds, I mean, I, I otherworldly. Like you, could, probably hard to believe that it's the same country you live in. It is. It yes, all those things. Otherworldly is a really good description, you know. Uh, um, and it's moments like that, you know. You you asked me about uh, sort of decompressing the trip, and and uh, it's moments like that that I'm still like processing because you know you're out there and you're doing it, and and. In a, in a way, you're kind of fighting the clock. You're fighting with the weather. Uh, you're at the mercy of a pilot who is thinking about 10,000 different things that you're not thinking about. And um, and so you get out there and you do it, and, and it's incredible. But it's only later that you sit back and you think about how extraordinary that whole thing was um, and the um, how, how extraordinary and lucky you are to have been there and to be able to do it and to see a place that so few people get to see. Just that one park puts you in just a, a realm that literally a hundred people a year can, can join. <laughs> that's right. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. So let, let, let's, let's jump to maybe around, you know, summertime, right around when you were in Alaska, how, how was the trip going? Were you, were you staying on course? Were you know, was your truck running well? Was the plan working? Were you having a good time? What was it looking like? For the most part, uh, it did seem to be going okay. Um, you know, right before I got to Alaska, uh, like a week or two out when I was in the um, uh, Northwest in Oregon and Washington, um, I got a call from my travel agent who said that um, the company that we used to book all of my reservations in Alaska had mysteriously gone out of business and she uh, couldn't contact anybody there. And she wasn't confident in what, uh, what items on my itinerary had actually been paid for. And I paid this company in advance, so I had already forked out the money. So, um, there was a little, it was a little tenuous there, um, for a couple of weeks trying to figure out what um uh what was booked and what was not booked it ended up all working out you know it's moments like that uh you know but you don't let it get to you you're gonna go and you're gonna do it it just um and everything worked out fine but um i don't even remember what your original question was mason sorry no just how it was going at that point that's that's definitely stressful <laughs> It was stressful, but part of my MO for this whole trip was just, it was just, just roll with it, roll with whatever happens. And I was, you know, uh, trying to remove my uh, control tendencies and, and just let the trip be what the trip is. And it was, while it was sort of personally important to me to finish it and hit all the parks, um, I knew that if I didn't, I would still have an incredible experience to remember and that's what was important. Absolutely. So, so 
What's one thing you learned about America through this experience? I learned so much about this country. Um, and I think that is my biggest takeaway from this whole trip that a couple of things, but most notably that, um, when you take the national park system uh, as a whole in totality, it really is like the greatest overview of the United States of America that you can get anywhere. And, and I had never really considered that before. You know, I very used to traipsing around and camping in the, the bigger, you know, national park sites and national monuments and wreck areas and that kind of stuff. But also diving into all those historical places, um, uh, learning learning a lot more about the Civil War when I thought that I already had a good grasp on it, um, uh, World War II, all these kinds of things, uh, Japanese internment camps. Um, you know, the park, the National Park Service, it's not all, you know, uh, waterfalls and snow-capped mountains. You know, there's a lot of history, both good and bad. And, you um, and to be able to dive into all of it and really absorb it and learn it um, was a tremendous gift. And it, it changed my perspective on this country in a lot of different ways. But it also gave me a real renewed sense of the diversity uh, in the country, not just and I don't mean just like cultural diversity. And there's plenty of that on display as well within the national park system, but also the diversity in our <clears throat> our land and our geography. Um, you know, the trip, the trip took me to all 50 states. It took me from the Caribbean to uh, the other side of the international date line. It took me from north of the Arctic Circle to south of the equator. Uh, and, you know, everything is rolled up into that. Um, uh, the deserts, the mountains, the rivers, the seashores and lake shores, the wetlands, the the um, the plains and the prairie, everything that you can imagine. It's really tremendous. And when you sort of when you have all of this uh, experience um, put on your plate at one time, you get a very clear picture of what the United States of America is. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. That was that was beautiful. <laughs> I'm gonna use that for the uh, for the show intro a little carrot that we play. That was incredible, man. When you put the when you put the boundaries on the geography of where you went. You, you you saw everything the, the 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 vastness of what the planet itself has to offer, from tropics to the Arctic to, you know the you know below sea level to some of the highest summits in the hemisphere, and to be able to experience that all in one country is pretty mind boggling. And to be able to do it all within a year, I, I'm just still I know I keep saying it, I'm sure listeners are tired of it. I'm just blown away. <laughs> How did you end the experience, and what was it like? coming through, you know, the fall, where were you going? And, and what was that feeling like as you, as you approached kind of this, the last quarter of the trip? The last bit of the trip was, um, spent mostly in the, uh, the, uh, Northeast, um, and, uh, uh, the New England States and then coming back down, uh, towards my home in, uh, uh St. Louis, up there in the the sort of northeastern cities, and especially in like like Washington D.C., the parks are much smaller in general, and they're clustered very tightly together. And you can actually visit a lot of them very quickly. So, for example, in one day in Washington D.C., I visited ten national park units. First off, I've you know I've been to D.C. many times before, and so I've already seen all these spots before. But even with that, I still felt like I I spent you know a decent amount of time at each place. And I'm talking about like uh, the Jefferson Memorial, um, uh, Martin Luther King Memorial, uh, Lincoln Memorial, uh, Washington Monument, you know, uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, Korean War Veterans Memorial, all those little places around the National Mall. They're all individual national park units. 
And um, I knew that there were going to be times on the trip where I could fit several visits into a day comfortably. And that helped me balance out longer visits in some of the other places that I wanted to spend more time or places that took longer to get to. And then uh, uh, wound my way back down to uh, the Midwest. I spent December, uh, the, most of December, I went back to the Virgin Islands uh, for a quick trip to pick up a few parks there that were closed in uh, January. And then I headed out to the Pacific where I visited parks in Guam, uh, four of the Hawaiian Islands and American Samoa. And then I came back and had my last park stop, which was number 419, was here in my home. It was Gateway Arch National Park. <laughs> right there in your backyard. Right there in my backyard, yeah. Did you tell anybody when you when you completed it? Did you tell anybody at the park service? Uh, it's interesting. By that time, some folks at the park service had caught wind of what I was doing. And actually, uh, Gateway Arch National Park reached out to me earlier in the year and to see if they could um, do something a little more special for my arrival. <clears throat> And it's uh, when I got down there on um, New Year's Eve uh, for my park visit, my last park visit, there was a, a throng of reporters and press and park rangers and, and lots of random folks from town who um, came down to, uh, to say hi and to meet me. It was pretty special. Wow. What an incredible experience. Let me ask you this. On January 1st, you wake up. Nowhere to go. What do you do? What do you do? What do you start doing after that? So I, you know, I'm not a young man. I was uh, 47 when I finished the uh, the trip. Uh, what I didn't realize, well, I kind of was started to feel it towards the end, but what I didn't really realize was how exhausted I was by the experience. And it was only after I finished the trip and uh, uh, was able to sort of chill at home for a little while that I, I realized how much it had taken out of me. You know, I, the best way I can describe it is it, it, it feels like I spent two years worth of energy in one year. And in some ways, I'm, I'm still kind of recovering from that a little bit. The, <clears throat> in, in, in a sort of ironic sort of way, the uh, coronavirus, uh, you know, shut down and the measures we've been taking have kind of been a blessing to me because I've, I've been able to sit at home and recoup and get my life put back together after the trip and things like that. So uh, that's been kind of nice. Obviously, a trip like this takes so much time to process, like you've been saying, and a break is welcome. And good thing you didn't plan it for 2020, you know. that's Oh, no kidding. Oh, no geez. Kidding. That, there wouldn't have been a possibility, I, I guess. I don't think it would have been doable. No, I don't think it would have been the amount that you're moving around and interacting with communities and the fact that the parks weren't just closed. They were closed, closed. And yeah, what what great timing in a lot of ways. So the shutdown was just a bump in the road in comparison, you know, looking back. Yeah, it was. The shutdown was a bump in the road. And of course, when you're in the middle of it, it feels like the end of the world when you're trying to execute <laughs> it like this. And um I spent a lot of time fretting over it uh, when I was in the middle of it, but but pretty quickly after it was over, um, and I felt like I was uh, getting the trip back on track, and it was becoming what I intended it for it to be. Uh, I got over that pretty quickly, and yeah, looking back, for, you know, sitting here in 2020, looking back, it definitely just feels like this minor blip. Where does your mind go from here? You've seen all the parks. Well, there's. 423 now like you said there might be a, a few that you still need to see i'm not sure where do you go planning wise do you just let that come to you at some point or is your mind working towards anything i am thinking a lot about uh returning to some of the places that i i'd like to go back to you know death valley i'd like to figure out a trip back up to alaska sometime before too long um a lot of little parks, you know, here and there dotted around the country that I'd, I'd like to get back to or places, you know, there, there's a good handful of places that I visited on the trip where I, you know, I got there and I'm like, oh, yeah, there's more to see here than I expected. And uh, I don't really have the time to do it right. 
you know, uh, with, with what I'm doing right now. And I, I want to come back and, and see more or, or there's a trail or a road that I really wanted to do, but, you know, didn't quite have the time or the weather was bad or one thing or another. So it's a lot of little things like that uh, in parks all over, big ones and little ones um, that are sort of calling me back. And I suspect I'll spend, you know, the rest of my good years uh, uh, going back to a lot of those places. I I imagine. So, so, you know, I know it's kind of backtracking here, but I'd love to ask, was there was there a park in particular that that stuck out to you as as maybe my kind of more one of the more bizarre parks or kind of out of the box parks or 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 a place that just really surprised you there were a lot of surprises um you know some of the ones that surprised me the most were parks that have a very heavy emotional impact and those are some of the ones that i wasn't really expecting or prepared for. And I, I'm talking about like um, Manzanar National Historic Site in California, which which preserves the site of a Japanese internment camp during World War II. And we actually have four park units that are dedicated to uh, uh, the history of Japanese American internment. Uh, that, one, that one in particular, um, the Sand Creek Massacre site in Colorado, which is a relatively new park and has barely anything going on there um, right now. Uh, that is a, that's one of the most intense uh, park experiences I've ever had. Just um, incredibly uh, uh, emotional experience. The Flight 93 Memorial in Pennsylvania, uh, also incredibly moving. And one of the <clears throat> one of the ones that really surprised me the most was um, uh, Kalawapapa National Historic Site in uh, uh, Flor uh, in uh, Hawaii. And this is a park that's a little difficult to access, and it's the only park unit that we have that has an age restriction. You have to be 16 or older to visit. It's the site of a, a, a leper colony, uh, something around 8,000 lepers were more or less imprisoned on this peninsula in Hawaii for over a hundred years, uh, over a, uh, throughout a hundred year period. And most of them died there. And it's, um, it's so hard to even describe, but um, uh, it's an incredibly beautiful place. It's one of the most beautiful places I visited last year, but it's also one of the saddest and um, just uncompromising uh, emotional places that I visited last year. You know, <clears throat> it's those those kinds of places that really stuck with me. Uh, Johnstown Flood uh, National Historic Site, there's a handful of them. Those were the ones that really surprised me. Those sort of deeper dives into some moments in American history. The uh, Port Chicago Naval Magazine um, National Memorial, which is in uh, the Bay Area in California, also very difficult to get to, um, has about uh, 600 visitors a year. You have to apply in advance, two weeks in advance for a security clearance to go there because it's on an active military base. And then you have to uh, apply for a tour to go out there and they don't run the tours every day. So anyway, it's <clears throat> places like that, that that just really kind of hit me in a way that I wasn't expecting. And that's not even to take into account, you know, the, the emotional thrill of, you know, hiking on a glacier in Wrangell St. Elias National Park or sitting at Brooks Falls and watching the coastal brown bears catch salmon right out of the river and eat them. Um, there's the whole trip is just filled with, you know, uh, getting to lower, help lower and fold the gigantic American flag at the end of the day that flies over Fort McHenry. Um, there's just a, a, a zillion moments like that, seeing a pod of orcas uh, swim uh, through uh, uh, Kenai Fords National Park, um, all these kinds of things. Uh, every day was filled with moments like this that um, you know, over an entire lifetime would, would shape an individual, but to have all that condensed into one year is, it's, um, it's almost more than you can bear. Just hearing about it, I can't imagine 
Unbelievable. Andy, this is probably one of the most impressive accomplishments and most, I, I, I'm not often jealous of people. I'm jealous of this. You know, it, it's, uh, I, I know that there's, there's, you know, we're not even scratching the surface on the work that went into it, the preparation or, uh, what, you know, what led you to this in life to, to have this opportunity, but just congratulations on, on taking full advantage of it. I don't think there's anyone out there who's had a year of their life so filled with so much life. So you should be able to, to sip on that for the rest of your days. <laughs> I, I hope so, Mason. I, I appreciate that very much. I, I, uh, it, 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 you know, the, the, the journey was very personal for me and I undertook it for personal reasons, but it means so much to me that it means something to others. And, um, I, I get a lot of pride out of that. Well, we're, we're fans of it here in the, in the Gravely household, 100%. Uh, so, so let, let us know, you know, this is something that people can also enjoy now through your pictures and, um, through your website. Do you mind sharing where folks can just see what you did and maybe get in touch if, if, if that's something you're interested in? Absolutely. Uh, before the trip, I set up a website, uh, and it's called 418parks.com. That's number 418parks.com. And I've got um, so select photos and uh, a blog that I'm relatively proud of uh, on the website. And they can also contact me through the website if they're interested. Uh, if anybody is on Facebook, I'm pretty good at keeping up with my 418 Parks Facebook page. Uh, just posted something today. Um, and uh, you can scroll back through that. I was pretty active almost every day on Facebook during or most every day during the trip, uh, updating photographs and parts of the experience. Um, and then also 418 Parks on Instagram, which is more or less inactive right now, but there's a nice catalog of, uh, of photographs on my uh, Instagram feed. I can also, I can second that. The pictures are amazing. I just loved seeing the updates. And uh, yeah, it was a year-long experience for you and a year-long experience for folks following along. So Andy, thank you for joining the Avenger Sports Podcast. I'll let you know when the episode comes out. It's usually about a month or so after recording that we release it. And uh, I'll just, I'll email you and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, sounds good. Thank you so much, Mason. It's really great to talk to you. Yeah. Let me know if you're ever down in Florida. Oh man, I'm, when I come back down to Florida, I'm going to uh, uh, hook up with you and buy you a beer. Oh, hey, I work at a brewery, so that'll work out just fine. Oh, <laughs> outstanding, outstanding. All right, Mason, thank you right, so yeah. much, man. Have a great day. Great we'll talk to you. All right, bye-bye. See ya. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.